Click on the like and subscribe buttons. Your support will be greatly the greed appreciated. greed and imperialistic goals of the European nations. Chapter 3. New Enemies Disguised as Friends. The Ghanaian writer, A. Adu Bohen, in the article, The Coming of the Europeans, circa 1440 through 1700, gives us the following information about this significant event in history. Africa, south of the Sahara, has been known to Europeans since Greco-Roman times, but it was not until the fourth decade of the 15th century that they began to arrive in numbers on its shores. The first to come were the Portuguese. They were followed in the 1450s by the Spaniards, who soon after abandoned Africa to explore the Americas. Toward the end of the century, some English and French adventurers and traders arrived. However, their governments were not to give official backing to such enterprises until the 16th and 17th centuries. The Dutch were the next to appear on the African scene, and during the last decade of the 16th century, they effectively challenged the lead enjoyed by the Portuguese. The Danes dropped anchor in 1642, the Swedes in 1647, and the Brandenburgers in 1682. The reasons for the sudden surge of interest were partially political, partly economic, partly technological. In the first place, no overseas activities could succeed without the patronage and direction of a strong nation-state enjoying stable and peaceful conditions at home and no such nation-states emerged in Europe until after the end of the 14th century, and these continued to be racked by foreign and civil wars for another hundred years or more. The nation-states of Europe stabilized themselves and developed their economy mainly at the expense of African people. Professor Bowen further tells us that, on balance then, politically, economically, and socially, the European presence and activities in Africa during the second period, were virtually an unmitigated disaster for the Africans. By 1700, all the great hopes that had been conjured up during the earlier phase of exploration had turned sour. To borrow Basil Davidson's terms, Africa had by then turned into the Black Mother, producing slaves solely in the interest of the growing capitalist system in Europe and the New World, and it was to do this for another 150 years. At the beginning of their contact, Sub-Saharan Africa was politically, culturally, and artistically comparable to Europe. By 1700, Europe had leaped forward technologically and socially, but Africa and its black peoples had become paralyzed and impoverished, a tragedy from which they still have not recovered. In his pamphlet, The Man Who Stole a Continent, John Weatherwax spoke collectively of the British entry into the slave trade. While he used a single figure in relationship to this entry, he was actually referring to the collective assault of Europeans on the west coast of Africa and how the slave trade became a three-continent industry. There was a man who stole a continent, being cruel as well as greedy, and possessing power, he enslaved 20 million of its people, sending them over the ocean, 10 million to the eastern hemisphere, and 10 million to the western hemisphere. In the process of capturing the 20 million people whom he sold, 80 million other people died, some during slave raids. For when a village was raided, often the very young and very old and the sick were killed. Some from exposure, disease, and grief during shipment abroad, and some by suicide at the water's edge or in transit. The sale of 20 million human beings as slaves gave the man hundreds of millions of treasure but this was only the start of his enrichment. He and his children and grandchildren and those to whom they sold slaves received much, much more, many billions more, through the unpaid labor of whole generations of slaves. But this, too, was not at all the end of their enrichment. Professor Weatherwax concludes his analysis of the start of the slave trade in the following manner. For the morality of the man who stole a continent and of his children and grandchildren and agents can only be characterized as the most way out evil this world has ever known. And way out evil is satanic and has only one possible end, to be cast out altogether and forever from the society known as humankind, to be cast into the burning fire, which is its natural home to be remembered only by the generations which follow its end as the most devastating catastrophe that ever befell mankind.
The events described by John Weatherwax were the beginning of the African Holocaust in a period of protracted genocide that would change the political character of the world for all times to come. Chapter 4. Slave Trade and Slavery in Retrospect In the short appraisal of Christopher Columbus in the African Holocaust, I have reopened and re-examined a much written about subject that is still misunderstood by most people. The basis of this misunderstanding is in the fact that most students of this subject look upon the African slave trade as though it were the only system of slavery known to man. Slavery is an old institution, and there are no people who have not at some time in history been a victim of it. The African slave trade can best be understood if we at least take a brief look at the historical roots of slavery as a world institution. Slavery in ancient societies was appreciably different from the type of slavery that was introduced into Africa by the Europeans in the 15th and 16th centuries. In most ancient societies, the slave was held in servitude for a limited time for specific reasons, and in most cases, the slaves were captured in local wars. Skin color was not a factor as to whether a person did or did not become a slave, and, in most cases, the slaves had some rights that the master had to respect. In ancient Egypt, Cush, Greece, and early Rome, there were clearly defined codes of conduct governing the relationship between the slaves and their masters. Some of the earliest of these codes are recorded in the laws of Moses. In the book The History of Slavery and the Slave Trade by W. O. Blake, published in 1858, the following information relating to early slavery is revealed. The Mosaic institutions were rather predicated upon the previous existence of slavery in the surrounding nations, then designed to establish it for the first time and the provisions of the Jewish law upon this subject, affected changes and modifications which must have improved the condition of slaves among that particular people. There were various modes by which the Hebrews might be reduced to servitude. A poor man might sell himself. A father might sell his children. Debtors might be delivered as slaves to their creditors. Thieves who were unable to make restitution for the property stolen were sold for the benefit of the sufferers. Prisoners of war were subjected to servitude. And if a Hebrew captive was redeemed by another Hebrew from a Gentile, he might be sold to another Israelite. At the return of the year of Jubilee, all Jewish captives were set free. However, by some writers, it is stated that this did not apply to foreign slaves held in bondage as, over those the master had entire control. The law of Moses provides that if a man smite his servant or is made with a rod, and he die under his hand, he shall be surely punished. This restriction is said, by some, to have applied only to Hebrew slaves, and not to foreign captives who were owned by Jews. Mosaic laws declared the terms upon which a Hebrew, who had been sold, could redeem himself or be redeemed by his friends and his right to take with him his wife and children when discharged from bondage. The main point of this reference is that the slaves of the ancient world were considered with some humanity. This was nonetheless true of ancient Asia and Africa. In fact, in Africa, in both ancient and modern times, Slaves have been known to rise above their servitude and become kings in the very houses in which they had been slaves. The fact that slavery existed in West Africa prior to contact with Europeans is often used to excuse the European slave trade. The two systems had few similarities. The tragic and distinguishing feature of the slave trade that was introduced by the Europeans was that it totally dehumanized the slave. This dehumanization continued in many ways throughout the slavery period and well into the colonial era. This crucial act was supported by a rationale that was created in part by the Christian Church and extended by the writers of the 17th and 18th century. The myth of a people with no history and culture comes out of this period. All myths are contagious and one can create many others. This fact can be better understood after some insight into how and why the slave trade came to be. Early in the 15th century, Europe began to recover from the wounds of the Middle Ages and the Crusades. European skill in shipbuilding had improved, and in search of a food supply for their hungry population and for new worlds to conquer, Europeans began to venture beyond their shores. There are many reasons why the Europeans had not embarked upon worldwide exploration before this time. 
Their ships were small and unsafe for long sea journeys. Oars were sometimes used to propel these ships, and the outcome of all voyages depended largely on the wind. There were no good maps or instruments to guide sailors through unknown waters. At that time, most Europeans were ignorant about the shape of the world, and some of them thought it was flat. The Portuguese set out to disprove this, and, about the middle of the 15th century, they began trading with the people along the west coast of Africa, to which they gave the name Guinea after the Sudanic Empire of Ghana. At first, they traded mainly in gold, but before long, they began to take slaves also. Social and political unrest began to develop among some of the nations of West Africa at the time Europe was regaining its strength and a degree of unity. The first Europeans to visit the west coast of Africa did not have to fight their way in. They came as guests and were treated as guests. Later, they decided to stay as conquerors and slave traders. In order to gain a position strong enough to attain these ambitions, they began to take sides in African family disputes, very often supplying the family or tribe they favored with arms and using their favorites as slave catchers. A number of African nations went into the slave trade in order to buy guns and other European manufactured items. Others were forced to capture slaves or become slaves. The Europeans did not come to Africa initially to find slaves. For years they had been hearing stories about the great riches of Africa. At the Battle of Cutta against the Muslims in 1415, Prince Henry of Portugal, who later became known as Prince Henry the Navigator, heard about the prosperity of Timbuktu and the wealth of the great states along the west coast of Africa. He also heard stories about a great African Christian king named Prester John. Before the end of the 15th century, the Portuguese sailors had come to know the general shape of the continent of Africa. They traded regularly with African countries from 1471 on. Forts were built along the coast of West Africa. The most famous of these forts, still in existence, is Elmina Castle, in what is now Ghana. This fort was started in 1482 by a Portuguese captain, Don Diego de Azambuya. Because of the large profits gained by the Portuguese in their trading in this country, they called it the Gold Coast. During the latter half of the 15th century, European nationalism was reflected in the expansion of trade in both sales and manufactured goods. The marriage of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand gave Europe the unity to drive out the Arabs and the Moors. Both Spain and Portugal were becoming powerful Mediterranean nations. In 1488, Bartholomew Diaz had sailed around the southern tip of Africa. About ten years later, another Portuguese sailor, Vasco da Gama, sailed past the point reached by Diaz. With the help of an Arab pilot, Vasco da Gama reached India in 1498. For Europe, the door to the vast world of Asia was open. The rationale for justifying the slave trade had already started in Europe with Europeans attempting to justify the enslavement of other Europeans. This is a neglected aspect of history that is rarely taken into consideration. There was a concerted effort to obtain European labor to open up the vast regions of the New World. In what became the United States, white enslavement started before black enslavement. In an article, White Servitude in the United States, published in Ebony in November 1969, the Afro-American historian Lerone Bennett Jr. gives the following information about this period. When someone removes the cataracts of whiteness from our eyes, and when we look with unclouded vision on the bloody shadows of the American past, we will recognize for the first time that the Afro-American, who was so often second in freedom, was also second in slavery. Indeed, it will be revealed that the African American was third in slavery, for he inherited his chains, in a manner of speaking, from the pioneer bondsmen who were red and white. The enslavement of both red men and white men in the early American colonies was a contradiction of English law. The colonies were founded with the understanding that neither chattel slavery nor villainage would be recognized. Yet forced labor was widely used in England. This system was transferred to the colonies and used to justify a form of slavery that was visited upon red and white men. Concise information on this system and how it developed is revealed in the book Slavery and Abolition, 1831 through 1841, by Albert Bushnell, first published in 1906.
It was decreed that the apprentice must serve his seven years and take floggings as his master saw fit. The hired servant must carry out his contract for his term of service. Convicts of the state, often including political offenders, were slaves of the state and were sometimes sold to private owners overseas. The colonists claimed those rights over some of their white fellow countrymen. There was a large class of redemptioners who had agreed that their service should be sold for a brief term of years to pay their passage money, and of indentured or indented servants brought by their masters under legal obligation, who served even longer terms, subject to the same penalties of branding, whipping, and mutilation as African slaves. These forms of servitude were supposed to be limited in duration and transmitted no claim to the servant's children. In spite of this servitude, the presumption in law was that a white man was born free. The English settlers had, at once, begun to enslave their Indian neighbors, soothing their consciences with the argument that it was right to make slaves of pagans. In large numbers, the Indians fled or died in captivity, leaving few of their descendants in bondage. The virgin soil of the new English settlements continued to need more labor. This led to a fierce search for white labor that subsequently led to a search for black labor. Bennett continues, It has been estimated that at least two out of every three white colonists worked for a term of years in the fields or kitchens as semi-slaves. White servitude was the historic foundation upon which the system of black slavery was constructed. There is a need to examine the slave trade and slavery in the role of Christopher Columbus and his voyages in setting this great tragedy in motion. I am attempting to examine the slave trade and slavery with fresh insight and with a focus on long, neglected aspects of this subject. Africans played a major role in opening up the New World for European settlement. Their labor and the raw material taken from their countries were imported features in the development of the European Industrial Revolution. Chapter 5. The Slave Trade. How and Why It Started. To understand the African slave trade, we must understand slavery as an institution, an institution almost as old as human society. Every people, sometime or another, have been slaves. In fact, Europeans enslaved other Europeans for a much longer period than they enslaved Africans. Slavery was a permanent feature of the ancient world, in Egypt, Cush, and Rome. The African slave period is best known to us because it is the best documented. However, these documents are often confusing because they were created by people who were trying to justify the slave trade. Most people, especially Europeans who created most of the documents on slave trade, write about the subject with the intent to make the victim of slavery feel guilty and to vindicate the perpetrators of the slave trade. There is probably more dishonesty related to the interpretation of the subject than any other subject known to man. The African slave trade, like African history, is often written about but rarely understood. This misunderstanding probably grows out of the fact that we nearly always start the study of the African slave trade in the wrong place. The germ, the motive, the rationale for the African slave trade started in the minds of the Europeans in the 15th and 16th centuries. The slave trade could not have started at all had there been no market for it. The slave trade started when the Europeans began to expand out into the broader world. The market was created by Europeans for European reasons. The story of the African slave trade is essentially the story of the consequences of the second rise of Europe. In the years between the passing of the Roman Empire in the 8th century and the partial unification of Europe through the framework of the Catholic Church in the 15th century, Europeans were engaged mainly in internal matters. With the opening of the New World and the expulsion of the Arabs and the Moors from Spain during the latter part of the 15th century, the Europeans started to expand beyond their homeland into the broader world. They were searching for new markets, new materials, new manpower, and new land to exploit. The African slave trade was created to accommodate this expansion. The basis for the European Industrial Revolution had already been established. They had already created embryo technology, including the gun. In the years that followed, they also used other advantages, mainly a large fleet of ships and rabble soldiers and sailors with no sentimental attachment to non-European people, 
to take over most of the world. In so doing, they destroyed a large number of nations and civilizations that were older than any in Europe. The main problem with the African in dealing with the European during this early period was the African's tragic naivete. He had never dealt extensively with this kind of people. He came out of a society where nature was kind. Nature furnished him enough food, enough land, enough of the basic things he needed to live a pretty good life. These old African societies were governed by honor and obligation. Land could neither be bought or sold. There were no fights over the ownership of land. The land belonged to everyone. The European, coming from a society where nature was rather stingy and where he had to compete with his brother for his breakfast, his land, and his woman, had acquired a competitive nature that the African could not deal with. In order to justify the destruction of these African societies, a monster that still haunts our lives was created. This monster was racism. The slave trade and the colonial system that followed are the parents of this catastrophe. The Europeans, mainly the Portuguese who came to the west coast of Africa in the 15th century, were not at first looking for slaves. The search for gold and other treasures lured them to Africa. They did not have to fight their way into the continent. They came as guests and were treated as guests. Then they grew strong, decided to be conquerors, and turned on their hosts. Another myth we have to dispel is that the Europeans came to Africa to spread civilization. Actually, most of the great civilizations in Africa declined after the coming of the Europeans. For years, the Europeans had been hearing rumors about African cities of gold and beautiful women. There were also legends circulated in Europe about a great emperor in Ethiopia called Prester John. But when the Portuguese arrived in Africa, Prester John had been dead for 300 years, and they looked for him on one side of Africa, and he had been on the other. But no European came to Africa to tame any raw savage. When the Europeans first saw the cities of Africa, they reported that these cities were well designed and that the African was civilized to the marrow of his bones. Fifty years later, when they wanted to justify the slave trade, they started the myths about savage Africa, with no organized societies, no cities, even no knowledge of the wheel. The European did not enter Africa to bring civilization. In fact, no nation ever invaded another nation for any reason other than to exploit that nation for its own reasons. This is true even when whites invade whites. It's true when browns invade browns. And it's also true when blacks invade blacks. The intent of every invader, no matter what his color, is to establish his own way of life and, in nearly every case, the local culture suffers. This happened when the Europeans invaded the west coast of Africa. We have their words that they did not meet an uncivilized people. We also have their word that they encountered not only well-organized societies, but societies that had a great deal of order and beauty. In 1434, a small fleet of Portuguese ships sailed down the coast of Africa and established some trading posts. By 1441, they were taking some of the tropical riches out of Africa and also a few slaves they bought who had been prisoners of war, captured in some local skirmishes among Africans. By 1482, they had built the fortress of Elmina Castle, the beginning of forts built by Europeans along the coast of West Africa to protect themselves from the Africans when the slave trade was established. In fact, the slave trade did not really get underway until the Europeans had these fortresses built. And while building the forts with the help of Africans, They were telling the Africans that they had come to deal in honorable trade, and the naive Africans believed this story. These fortresses actually served as holding stations for the slaves that they were shipping to the New World. Incidentally, the Scandinavians entered the slave trade after the Portuguese, but they did not have any appreciable success, and they became middlemen in the slave trade. Then, when the Arabs and Moors were expelled from Spain, they returned to Africa after being the masters of the Mediterranean for 750 years. They had no sentimental attachment to Africa. They began to prey on the nations south of the Sahara, principally the old empire of Songhai. They first claimed the salt mines, for salt was then so precious that traders gave two parts of gold for one part of salt. They sent troops from what is now Morocco down into the area. The fight over the salt mines at Tagaza on the edge of the Sahara Desert became a great political and economic struggle. But something else happened, too. 
Christopher Columbus had, by sheer accident, started to look for the East Indies, and instead found what was later called the West Indies. A new world was open to Europeans, and they promptly began their exploitation. On the like and subscribe buttons, your support will be greatly appreciated.